morning, ladies and gentlemen, and apologies for the couple of wrinkles, just sorting out the technology here. Um, I'd like to, without further ado, introduce Roger Parsons today, who's going to be giving the presentation. Some of you will know Roger, some not. Anyway, Roger grew up in East London. After matriculating from Selborne College, he went to Rhodes University, completed a BSc, a BSc geology, geology honours degree. Um, with geography as well before embarking on an MSc in geohydrology where he investigated groundwater resources to supplement crop and its water supply. In 2014, he was awarded a PhD degree from the University of the Free State for his research on the role of groundwater in sustaining cornflay, a lacustrine wet land located near Sedgefield. He worked for the Department of Water Affairs and CSIR CSI before establishing Parsons and Associates, specialist groundwater consultants in 1996. He has a broad range of professional interests, including resource development, groundwater contamination, and the integrative role of groundwater in the environment. For the last four years, the world has been assisting with the government to help the groundwater supply system with critical infrastructure to uh, combat the threat of, a bit of future droughts. Um, he is a registered natural scientist and a member of the International Association of Hydrogeologists, the International Association of Hydrological Sciences, the National Groundwater Association, and the Groundwater Division. He's a fellow of the Water Institute of Southern Africa and the Institute of Waste Management. So he's a, a, a very widely known, uh, well-qualified and important person. Some of you will also know Roger's wife, Jenny, who's a environmentalist. They live in Pringle Bay and Jenny's been quite involved in that sort of very topical issue around the baboons and in the Overstrand. So thanks, Roger, over to you. Thanks very much, John. Good morning, everyone. And good morning uh, to those of you on Zoom. I trust now that we've sorted out the, uh, the technology all as well. Uh, for those of you that aren't here, I'm standing next to a baby grand piano and I feel that I'm having to sing for my breakfast. All right, so where are my glasses? Yeah, all right, so, um, all right, I think we, we now in, in business. All right, so the presentation I'm going to give today is about assessing the effect of groundwater abstraction on a wetland. It's based simply on measured data and an assessment thereof. But there's a, like all things, there's a story to be told about why this is important to me, how I landed up with such good data, and why I was able to reach the conclusions of high confidence. So the story revolves around a devastating fire that swept through uh, Nisner in 2017. I'm sure most of you will, will remember that fire. Um, so the, the story here is how we had to develop and I use the word, um, the, the royal we, with, with liberalism here, but I'll explain that all just now. Mm -hmm. To develop a, a water supply in double quick time to save PG Bison from the effects of, of the drought and how uh, part of the uh, impact in um, impacting from uh, of a few people that I want to thank. Uh, firstly, is a chap by the name of Heine Miller. He was the regional manager of PG Bison, um, who is the poor guy that had to deal with the fallout of the fire from PG Bison's point of view. For my good friend and colleague, Richie Morris, who lives very close to, uh, to where the fire started. And Richie is a hydrogeologist himself. He's a, a contamination hydrogeologist uh, who's sort of semi-retired to that area. And he involved me in the project because of my, of my PhD. And then the third person I'd like to thank is a chap by the name of uh, Neil van Veek. He works for the Department of Water and Sanitation. And people in the water business, as Peter will probably share with you one day, is we love bashing the Department of Water Affairs. But Neil was incredibly kind and co incredibly competent at the, the job that he did. And I've got over a quarter of a million uh, measurements that they make on the water level in Grunfle, and he willingly provides that to us. So I'd like to, to acknowledge his support in providing 
providing me data that, that helps me get to, to where I want to go. I have an ability to tell long stories, but these two circles that I've got on the screen here are two circles in my life. So the first one revolves around the scientific method. When I was doing my PhD, and because I spend a lot of time driving a car, I have conversations with myself. And at, one day I was driving off to Ladysmith and I was in the middle of nowhere and I said, what is science? Now, I already had a, a master's degree in my back pocket and I had 30 years of experience as a scientist, but I struggled to understand what is science. And this graphic really summarizes it's the process of science. It's about making an observation. It's about reading up on things so that you can understand what people have done before you. It's about making an, an hypothesis on what you think or how you think that system works. It's a process of collecting data and information and analyzing it and coming up with a conclusion. And then that whole process starts all over again when someone builds on your knowledge or shoots your knowledge down. Uh, and that's, that's how we scientists behave. That's how our, our knowledge grows through life. The second uh, circle, set of circles that's equally important in, in this discussion is that around sustainability. Everyone loves talking about the environment, but the environment cannot operate by itself. It operates in, 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 with other considerations here with economics and social aspects. You can't just have one. And in the middle of those three circles is some sweet spot. Now, if you're too environmentally orientated, you'll go this way. If you're trying to make too much money, you go that way, and, and none of those are good. So somewhere in the middle there is a sweet spot. And I think the story that I'm going to tell you today will illustrate that quite nicely. Environmentalists also like to throw up this thing about the precautionary principle. What the precautionary principle is, is simplistically, is that if we don't know something, we can't do anything about it. We've got to be careful on the way we move forward. But the question that you really have to ask with a precautionary principle is who knows what? Um, the other thing is that we have to understand that uncertainty is real. Nothing in life is certain, of course, except death and taxes. But in our scientific environment, we will do things and we will make decisions, but there was always a degree of uncertainty. And it reminds me of this, this quote from Professor uh, Ty Ferrer, who was the Darcy lecture that came out to South Africa a couple of years ago. And he said, our data are sparse, our models are incomplete, but we must decide. And I think this is a, a very apt to, to the story that I'm gonna tell here. All right, so um, the 7th to 11th of June, uh, this devastating fire flared up. It's said to be the biggest uh, fire ever in the country, and it occurred during a perfect storm. There were very dry conditions, there were berg wind conditions, there were high winds, and then this fire started. I'm not going to get into the, into the discussion at all about how the fire started, whose fault it was. That's for other people to, to sort out. But this fire did start. And it started uh, up here. This is... Oh, the pointer work. doesn't work on the screen. No. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it, it started on the um, on the left-hand side of the screen where there's that big flash, and that's very close to where, where Richie lives, and nothing could stop it. It was on a steam steam train of its own. Uh, there were there were winds of over 60, 70 kilometers an hour, and this flame was just going. You just had to get out of the, out of its way. Now, in this part of the world, we all be uh, aware of fires and, and how they operate and how dangerous they could be. And it's useful to explain that this fire, and we compare it to the Betty's Bay fire uh, that took place in 2019 that uh, devastated the Betty's Bay community. And that's the difference of scale. So it gives you an idea on how, how big uh, this fire was. So um, after, after the fire, and I had the I suppose the privilege or the misprivilege, I don't know, of going to Nisner four or five days later. Um, and here were these towns that were now absolutely shattered with this fire having run through it. 
There were more than a thousand homes that were destroyed. Seven people died in that fire. Businesses left, right and center. The, the devastation was just unbelievable. And uh, the various governments, the national governments, the provincial governments, and particularly the, the Nisner municipality came up with this idea that we had to salvage, we had to rebuild, we had to rehabilitate and restore. They had to get back on their feet. So one of the, the things about fire, it leaves you with these very vivid and at times very beautiful images as these two show of, of uh, two of those thousand homes that were destroyed or badly damaged. But we should never forget that one of the main businesses uh, or economics of, of that region is the forestry sector, of which PG Bison is one of two players. They lost something like 15,000 hectares of uh, plantation was destroyed or damaged. And what is very interesting about the forestry sector, it takes a long, long time for them to re return their money. You know, they buy that land, they plant it, and 20 or 25 years later, they will get a return. What happens here is that the insurance company would only pay them out for the timber that was destroyed. So they had to set about um, recovering that timber that was damaged. It's the only thing that they could do to be part of the rebuilding and the, the rehabilitation. But it's not an easy, easy task. One of the buildings that was destroyed in the fire was one of the local sawmills. So when they were going through and they were cutting this wood down, they knew they were going to have a problem with harvesting this timber and then processing that timber. And if you leave timber lying around, it rots and is, is destroyed. So they had to come up with a plan of what can we do to uh, protect our timber until we can get it into the soil room. And they came up with this concept of a wet deck. So let me try and explain to you what a wet deck is. What they did is they stacked the, the salvage timber in these two piles. They were, um, in total, the pile was um, 25 meters wide, four and a half meters high, and three kilometers long. And I'll try to put that in perspective for you in a moment. And then they irrigated it with water because that would slow the oxygen getting into the wood and the, uh, um, the bugs and the fungus and all those things that do the damage. So this is what they did. This process would give them a, a window of three to four years in which to harvest the timber, stack it, and get it through the sawmill. So you know, four and a half meters wide, as wide as this room, maybe a little bit wider than this room. We, we can all understand that. But three kilometers is a hell of a lot of wood. So this is a photograph of when they were preparing for the wet deck. But even that doesn't give you an idea on how big it is. And I thought in terms of trying to put it in a local context to explain that it's from the Gateway Shopping Center to the circle in town. The whole road was stacked with wood, 25 meters wide, four and a half kilometers, uh, four and a half meters high. That's an incredible amount of wood. But what it also means is there was an incredible amount of water that was required. They estimated that it's about four and a half megaliters per day. And that's about double the amount of water that Royal Springle Bay and Claymont uses. So it's a substantial amount of water that they required. Through the work that I'd done in, in uh, 20, uh, 2009 during the drought, I developed a municipal well field that gave about uh, one and a half megaliters per day, about a third of that. So Richie was quite confident that, um, that we, could, we could get at least some of this water, if not all of it. The interesting thing, though, was that the aquifer that I developed was a primary aquifer. So it's a sandy aquifer that's not um, beach sand. This is the easiest way of describing it for the non-geologists. So uh, that is very different from a hard rock aquifer. But underlying parts of, of that area, is the Table Mountain Group. So that's this, um, that's this rock here. Sorry for the Zoom people, we are walked away. Um, 
So we knew that the Table Mountain Group was somewhere in the vicinity, but we had never drilled it. We'd never got into it. And in my PhD, I had to estimate how deep I, th I thought that the TMG was. But um, here we were saying we had the primary aquifer and the TMG aquifer as targets to develop this uh, four and a half megalitres per day. So Richie went about, he, he got a, a team of specialists involved and uh, it was just solid basic hydrogeology done at high pace. So the fire was in June, they were pumping water by September. So he, he was in there, we were getting people. And what's always nice about doing jobs like this, the, the, the details of, of contracts and proposals are quite flimsy because the objective is to get water. It's not to get the paperwork right, which is often not how it goes with consultants. He got a chap by the name of um, Jan, uh, I forget Jan's, um, Jan's surname, but he comes from, from Pretoria and he was a colleague of mine when I worked for Water Affairs in the, in the early stages of my career. And he came and did this uh, audio magnetic telerics, which is a geophysical technique where you put uh, electric current into the ground and the magnetic current. Uh, this is not my forte. What I can tell you is that they had to turn off all the electricity in the area to be able to do this work because the electricity signal would impact with that. So to get people to turn off their electricity, I know Eskim does it on a daily basis, but for mortals like us, yeah, that's quite a big deal. And this was the, uh, the graph that came out. And, and Richie interpreted that this is that there were these deep valleys where um, the rock had been eroded. So if you're driving along the Southern Cape and you go over those bridges and you look down at those gorges, the, the present day landscape, Richie was saying that this is what he thought was underlying there. And I think, he's, I think he was uh, pretty spot on. Um, and that gave us the idea on where we could drill. So in the bottom of these gorges would be these big uh, boulders and they would be very transmissive and they were ideal drilling targets. So he got um, two drilling rigs. The first one was Gary's Ball Solutions. Uh, we'd done a lot of work together in that area. And this is a, a very small drilling rig. Um, it's probably no bigger than these four or five chairs together. And Gary drilled the, the shallow ball. So it was a reverse circulation drilling for those of you interested in that uh, um, technicality. And he could drill down into the, into the primary aquifer or the semi-consolidated aquifer down to about 30 meters. And um, we got pretty good water as we would expect from my work uh, during the drought in 2009. And this just gives you an idea on uh, what the sediment looked like. So it was almost like a coarse grit that came out, it was much, much coarser than a sand. And that material allows water to move through it quite quickly. The second operation we had was uh, air percussion drilling, where we used Krista Stain of Port Elizabeth, also a chap that we'd worked with a lot, um, and he was going to drill down into the Table Mountain Group. So this was a little bit new to us on, um, on what we were doing, and we didn't know if we were going to get the Table Mountain Group, but you know, we'd done the geophysics, let's see what we, what we get. So that's a picture we love showing our clients. Whenever our clients come along, we wait, we let the ball fill up, and as soon as we see them, we say, okay, go, and they push the button, and then this water sprays out, and it looks very, very uh, effective. But let me try and show you what, it, what a, a real drilling rig looks like for those of you that haven't seen it. I'm always scared in case the technology fails here. Oh, there we go. Right, so they've now put rods in, they're going down and they've started the compressor. You can see the drillers know what's coming, so they all move, move aside. And it takes a good while before the water comes out. So we've blown air down the hole and that air drives the drilling hammer, but it also pushes out the water and pushes out the drilling chips. And then reality sits in, so that, that's more like the, the yield where we, get, where we were getting at that stage. But um, you know, it's, it's part of uh, who we are. Uh, and if I've let the cat, cat out the bag, I apologize for that. 
Right, so that's what we were getting. This is uh, looks very, very much like a hard rock, like Table Mountain Group. And if you look in that in that sample there, there's definitely a lot of boulders. At this stage, I'm not sure we were in the hard uh, the hard aquifer itself, but we were certainly in the in the boulders. And with the with the data that we had, we now had a, a fairly decent profile. It doesn't show these uh, these very deep ravines. Um, and I'm not sure why that is, but that's where our knowledge stands now. So what was nice about this was this was the first time we had any data on where the Table Mountain Group sat. Beforehand, we were guessing. Now we've got at least four boils that went into the Table Mountain Group. All of them were very high yielding, about eight liters a second. Um, how do I describe eight liters a second? Eight liters a second is probably enough to irrigate two thirds of a golf course. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial amount of water that came out. We went through the process of, of pump testing them all, trying to do the right thing. Um, and they, they all had a, a very similar yield of somewhere about seven or eight liters a second. We also checked the water quality. The water quality was very good, as we would expect from the Table Mountain Group, but that, that wasn't our, our focus uh, in the study at all. So we drilled them, we tested them, and then we had, to, um, we had to get them into production. There was no time for fancy DB boards and fancy electronics and fancy engineering. This was a blast boot that got a chap in they, they put the boils down. It was a, a, a green button and a red button to start on and, and switch off, put cages around them to protect them from vandalism and started pumping into these, uh, these big reservoirs. So this is just to, to show you what um, the layout of the land was. So the red line that you see on your screen is the wet deck, the wet deck which is about three kilometers long. The, uh, yellow dots are the production boils. Uh, don't worry about that southernmost production boil. That wasn't part of, of this story, but that's the water that they used to, to run the plantation. Um, the green dots are the ones that, um, that are important. The so RV4, which is a monitoring boil very close to production boil P4. And then specifically, we cited RV12 between the production boreholes and Hrunfle. Now, Hrunfle is quite hard to, to see there because it's uh, the color of, of the flay is not, a, not all that different from the color of the vegetation on the land, but uh, you, you can work it out. And that's what, what it looks like from the air. So this is a view from, from the north looking south. The ridge uh, that you see there separates the uh, the wet deck, which is a, a, a line that you see on the sort of bottom, bottom right hand side of the screen. And then uh, you can clearly see Hrunfle uh, to the south and the sea in the background. The problem was that this is a, an area filled with people that are very environmentally aware. So one of the favorite pastimes of them is that they jump to conclusions. So they drive along the, the N2 and they saw the, the level of Hrunfle dropping and all of a sudden uh, one plus one equals seven and a half. That was due to the pumping. Uh, and it was a small group that, that got very vocal about this impact. So we're not going to talk about the need for the pumping uh, and the environmental impact. Yeah, this was causing a problem on Hrunfle. It had to stop and uh, the fight got quite messy. But we were able to deal with it because we had good monitoring data. We were monitoring as things were going along. Uh, so we were able to, to make an assessment of, um, of what was going on. And we could ask the scientists, does groundwater abstraction from the Fairview well field affect Trunfler? Wonderful uh, master's degree kind of hypothesis or a research, research question. And we set a um, I set about um, trying to quantify this, and this graph is, is quite fundamental to, uh, to answering that. So let me just explain it. So the, the top line, it's um, a sort of a brownie color on my screen, gives you an indication of the production 
uh, that they were pumping. So they started pumping in sort of August 2017, uh, October 2017. And as the wood came in, uh, it ramped up and up and up. And at uh, full scale, they were pumping between four and four and a half megalitres a day. So the initial estimate was quite, quite good. You'll see slowly it tapers off. And then come around about um, the start of, of 2021, uh, the production starts tapering off um, quite, quite steeply. And the last groundwater that they pumped at all was in October 2021. The blue line is from that borehole RV12 between the production boreholes and Grunfle. And then the green line is the water level of Grunfle um, that was given to me by, by Neil von Beek. So it's really a good set of data. And the first thing we notice is the strong correlation between the borehole and Grunfle. The other thing is the decline in the level of Grunfle precedes the pumping. We also see after the pumping, the water level of uh, Grunfle doesn't recover, it doesn't go up. We then set about looking at um, using some basic science. Because I come from Rhodes University, where we didn't know, uh, do a lot of calculus, it wasn't part of our thing. We use a very simple equation of, it's a form of Darcy's law. Henry Darcy was the father of our science. He came from Dijon in, um, in France, and he was the municipal engineer. And uh, he, he came up with this law when he was studying the movement of, of water through sand filters. So basically what that says is the volume of discharge is equal to the transmissivity, and that's a, that's a measure of the ability of water to flow through a rock, through the hydraulic gradient, and the width through which that, that flow takes place. But what we do know, the transmissivity is a constant value and the width is constant. So the only variability is the hydraulic gradient. So if the gradient remains constant, the discharge will remain constant. We then go and look at it in a little bit more detail where we now uh, impose the, the water level induced by production. And this is this, this purple line with a couple of spikes. And you can see that when we pumped the ball, we dropped the water level by about 12 meters. But we got no response in Grunfle and we got no response in, uh, in RV12. And we got almost no response in the shallow uh, monitoring well PV4 which is only 80 meters away. So this was the first sign that there isn't any impact. The hydraulic gradient between these, these water bodies remained constant. So I'm very confident that there was no impact. The second thing we did was we looked at uh, what is known as the cumulative rainfall departure method. So all this is, is we look at monthly rainfall and uh, we, we see whether the that line goes up. So if you've got a lot of rainfall above the monthly, the line will go up. And if it's dry, the line will drop. And you'll see that red line compared to the green line, which is Krunfle. You'll see that pattern, how uh, the rain, when the rainfall is high, the Krunfle level goes high. When the rainfall is low, the Krunfle level starts dropping. And you'll see from October uh, 2016, you'll see that the, the rainfall was less than the average. And because of that, we see this continual drop in, um, in Hrunfle. If you look at right at the extreme, and this is hot off the press, you'll see that they have, in the last couple of months, they've had some good rainfall, and we've seen the response, that green line is, is now going up. Yet at this stage, we hadn't pumped the well field for, for two years. This is a, um, a graph of Hrunfle since 1977. So in 1977, they had quite a substantial drought. And this is when the Department of Water Affairs started formally monitoring the water level of Grunfle. And what's important about this graph is that there are a couple of periods that are uh, where the water level in Grunfle has been as low as the current. So in, in, the, in the late 70s, it got it. In the, in the late 80s, it got it. In the start of the, the century, it was sort of quite low. And then we've, um, we've got this seven year period where the, the water level is low. And what's important about that is what we have seen now is not unique. It's happened before when there was no pumping. 
the lowest level that we know of was measured by a chap by the name of, of Martin, who did some unbelievable research on Hunfle. He published his thesis in, in 1956. And he got it, uh, it was just above two meters above mean sea level. So this is, is, is not unique. So what, what we see here is, is really not surprising to me. So we, in hydrology, we use a water balance. So the amount of water coming in, the amount of water going out, and the change of storage should all be in balance. It should all make sense. And this is what my PhD thesis was. I, I drew up a daily model where I could, I could model the level of Hunfle based on the amount of groundwater that flowed in, the groundwater that flowed out, the rainfall and the evaporation. There is no surface water flow in there, so it makes it nice and, and simple. Uh, and I was, I was able to, to come up with um, the idea that about 72% of the input into Hunfle is rainfall, so a small amount is groundwater. The biggest loss, something like 80%, is, uh, is evaporation losses, and there's a little bit of groundwater that flows out, um, flows out to the south. So that red dot is, is what my estimates were. Uh, the other dots that you see on that screen are, are what other people were saying. So uh, we, all, we all talk in the same kind of language. But what this, what this information shows you is that... Um, Hunfle is driven, is driven by rainfall and it's driven by, by evaporation losses. And the groundwater that comes in plays a very minor supporting role. Um, that's just to, to show that um, if for my PhD, I did a daily model, but when you're working on weekends for free, you can't do that. So I tried a monthly model from 2013 and uh, I was able to get a very good match between the observed water level of Hrunfle and the, the modeled water level of Hrunfle. Uh, that suggested on that graph that uh, there was no impact of the groundwater abstraction. But in the model, I said, okay, what, what would happen if we did have an impact? So the first, uh, the bottom graph there shows you that you'll see that the blue line is starting to separate from the magenta line. And that's if I was saying 10% of the groundwater that was abstracted had an impact on, on Hrunfle. And then uh, I changed that up to, to 20% and you'll see the deviation. So on, on, this, on this, uh, this approach that I used here, there was no room in the maths to, to account for uh, the abstraction impacting the level of Hrunfle. All right, so, so what, what were my conclusions? We had to come back to that, that scientific question is, is this the groundwater abstracting Hrunfle? And I think uh, with a very high degree of certainty, I can, I can argue that there is no impact, not from the groundwater abstraction. But the science that I've, I've used here has shown that from 2015, 2016, when the drought hit, the level of Hrunfle started, um, started to drop. And what people were seeing was not because of the pumping, but rather a result of the drought. <laughs> The work that I did also showed important, the importance of monitoring. So we would have been able to draw up a, a, a computer model of sorts to, uh, to, to make these kind of estimations, but we would have had to estimate parameters. This assessment was based solely on measured data. What, what could we deduce from the information we gathered by, me uh, by measuring? And then the final thing on, on this, uh, this presentation was that they're sitting on top of a major water resource there, four and a half megalitres. So that's more than enough for Sedge Shield. They've got a continual problem at, at um, uh, what's it, at Biffles Bay, where this could easily be transported to, to Biffles Bay. They would stop having to use tankers. Uh, it's just a, a crazy setup. And that there's, a, there's enough water here to consider transporting it to Nyasna, which uh, also has a, a perennial water problem. What is quite interesting, though, is while everyone was, was complaining about the pumping and the, the impact of Hrunfle, Hrunfle changed from Hrunfle to brain flow. And this, this photograph taken by Stuart Lidstone uh, gives you a good impression on, on how that it goes from that, that murky green color to this, this, um, this brown color. And no one seemed to be particularly fussed 
about the fact that uh, initially bass were introduced to Hrunfle. It's a, a regionally or nationally recognized bass fishing um, venue, and they have the, the annual bass derby, and these guys come down with their fancy boats with 200 horsepower in the back and a, and a five horsepower in the front so they can maneuver all over the place. Um, after after the, uh, the bass were introduced in about 1990, the carp anglers came and they chucked a bucket of carp in there as well. What has caused this color is that between the bass and the carp, they've nailed the ecology of Hrunfle. Uh, Hrunfle had two very unique species that were adapted from estuarine species that were captured in Hrunfle when it, was, when it formed about 6,000 years ago. And this is the only place that these two species were found. And the, the bass and the carp nailed them to such an extent that they changed the, the color of the water. The interesting story is a group of, of people in Sedgefield started hunting the carp with bow and arrows. I mean, can you imagine that? They were standing on there. It expanded later to using nets. And to date, they've taken out about 40 tons. It depends who you speak to, but let's say about 40 tons of carp. And they've then taken this all up to the uh, the community of Smutsville, where they, they feed the community with them. So uh, it, the work was done by the gift of the givers, and I'm not going to go into discussion about the, the biblical meaning of uh, feeding a man with uh, feeding uh, fish to the masses. My next installment uh, that I'm going to tell you about, maybe in a year or two's time, above, uh, above Sedgefield is a very, very unique wetland called uh, called von Carvel's flow. And there's some debate about what is the hydrology of this. But way up in the wetlands, uh, there's this um, UCT researchers call it a floating bog. So it's this mass of, um, of vegetation that floats in water. And there's some debate about where the water comes from. From my research, I argue very strongly that it's uh, directly from rainfall. There's no surface flows and there's no groundwater flows. Uh, but when I've got some better data, I'll be able to stand here and tell you that story. So thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. That's fantastic. Um, did Alan get get back onto the show? Yes. Is he there? Okay. I'm right. Not sure with you. All right. I thought we were going to be quite comfortable not having a video. No, you've got lots of questions coming up. Start my video. Okay, questions from the hall. No, it's a, so, the, so the question is why was there not a reaction between uh, the pumping boils and the observation boil uh, of E12. And the reason is quite simple, is that the transmissivity of the, the system is so high that the, the code of influence is, is very narrow. It doesn't, it doesn't ex, uh, um, extend far. So if we had to carry for a long time, uh, as that cone spread and spread, we might start picking up small differences. But it's related to the hydrogeological properties and the ability of the sand to uh, to conduct water, um, so all of our monitoring was in the in the upper aquifer and not in the in the deeper TMG aquifer. So it's a little bit murky there, but um, principally it's driven by the primary aquifer, the high transmissivity of it. Ronnie Glass wants to know how did they ever allow carp and these fish to be introduced? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting question, and it, it, it goes back to, to all of us, how we, how we behave in the, in the environment. Um, 
So I'm going to make the, the assumption that in, 19, in the 1960s, we didn't really understand what the impact of introducing um, the bass into the system was. I understand that the introduction of carp was more covert than anything. It was a, a carp fisherman feeling a little bit left out. But I'm sure if there, if there are any people from Sedgefield watching, I'm sure I've just started a war. Um, but I, I think it's changed. You know, in, in 1994, I was on a, a project with the Department of Water Affairs in uh, Lambert's Bay, and they were still planting alien vegetation to stabilize dunes in 1994. In 1994, we started spending millions of rands in the uh, working for water, working for wetlands program to eradicate that. So I think it's, um, we, we've, got to, we've got to be a little bit careful in that uh, things change and knowledge change and we learn that, that some things are good and some things we did in the past weren't as good. Uh, the question is how do, we, how do we move forward because we can't change that. The same Ronnie Glass wants to know, was there any conclusion to the, the fire inquiry? Uh, yes, there was. Um, there was a report published by the CSR and uh, Sunlam, and they came up with a uh, with a finding on on the cause of that. If my understanding is correct, uh, there are a whole lot of court cases in in the background on on who did what, who started what, uh, and who was responsible. But they, if you go and look for the CSR Sunlam report of uh, 2017 2018. Um, there are some some people more knowledgeable than me that that have responded to that. And can you draw any similarities between the water body that we're sitting on and one that you did up there in terms of sustainability? Um, which which water body that we sitting on? Well, it depends which aquifer you're looking at. I mean, just, just by way of example, you know, we've got a shallow aquifer mm -hmm. through the Marnus, which yeah. we all pull. Yeah. And, and in this rain, that water is pouring out the ground. Um, and that's the importance of knowing, you know, which aquifers we're talking about. Yeah, so um, try, trying to answer that as best as I can. So it's all about the data being able to, to observe how water levels respond to, to drought and rainfall. Uh, in the Daily Maverick, um, in the drought of, I think they, we call it the 2016 drought of Cape Town, I set about writing periodically um, paper, uh, articles for the Daily Maverick to share my knowledge with groundwater because uh, the first thing that comes up when you talk about pumping groundwater is saline intrusion. There's this massive scare about saline intrusion you know, as a scientist, we don't want saline intrusion to happen because then we destroy our own business. Uh, uh, but anyway, we, through the work that I've done, we've got over 100 data loggers spread through the, the city of Cape Town. And the data that we show is that drought had no impact on groundwater. So uh, it depends on how much, how much groundwater is pumped, in what area it's pumped, what is dependent on it? So it's a, it's not a simple, straightforward answer. Um, if you, if you're concerned about it, you can put down a, a well point. It'll cost you about ten thousand rand, uh, and you go down eight meters, and you can put down a data logger, and it can measure water levels as often as you like. And, so it, and it's, it's very easy to collect this data. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think probably what Roger is touching on there too. When you look at this room, and it's a pet hobby horse of mine, is is the skills and the expertise. But I think the saddest thing for me too is, you know, the loss of those skills, and the fact that, um, you know, if you look at what's happened to Eskom, and and we spoke about it with Helcart, the Water Affairs Department, you know, we. It, given the, the environment and the, and the population growth we have today. We need the proper skills. We've got the tools to actually manage these systems. Maybe you want to comment on that. Well, you know, one of my hobby horses from a, a groundwater perspective, only three municipalities in the whole country employ any hydrogeological skills in-house. So that's nothing. 
Uh, Cape Town is, is um, announcing that they're spending 2 billion rand on bringing groundwater into production for the city of Cape Town. They do have two or three hydrogeologists. So at least they've got somebody advising them internally. But you take uh, a statistic I love quoting is that 60% of municipalities in South Africa are dependent on groundwater to one degree or another. 60%. 30% are totally reliant on groundwater. They have no other source. And yet there are no groundwater skills employed at, at that kind of level. It's very good for people like me because we get consulting jobs, but I, I don't think it's the right way to go. I do think some in-house consul- uh, in-house skills are, are required. And, and maybe just to comment on that again too, in January, I was fortunate with a group we, we went to to the Steenbrus Valley to look at the work that's going on there on the Steenbrus, and you will know it, Roger, Steenbrus aquifers. And, and it is just amazing to see, for example, the work that the city of Cape Town has done to their credit, yeah. the cleaning out the invasives. That, that, that valley is almost transformed. It is just amazing. And, and it just shows what, you know, unfortunately, it was a consequence, I guess, of the drought but just to see the quality of work there and, and the effort that's gone into that whole, you know, water improvement system, getting rid of the invasives. Um, you know, credit to our municipality here and Mvoto and people like Roger, I think you've had some involvement on our water supply system where 30% and it's growing of our water, potable water comes from the aquifer. But on the other hand, if you look at the destruction to the Onrus River system, you know, the estuary, Peter and people are involved, you, you know, there, there's a disconnect. And, and, and a lot of that gets back to us citizens again, you know, how we also roll up our sleeves and get involved. Yeah. You want to? No, I've, I can't add, you spot on. Can't add anything. And, and just on that, we want to do another trip. Um, but a voter, Dylan Blake, organized it last time. Lovely young person, but younger than us. You know, Roger's done amazing work, but they're, they're youngsters coming up the, the, the ranks as well. And they've done a superb work. Um, and we want to get, to get to do another trip there. It's well worth seeing, you know, we'll let you know in good time to, to take people along there. It's really worthwhile. So um, just a plug. To those that, um, that that might be interested, in uh, mid September we have in the International Association of Hydrogeologists uh, come and visit us. It's the third time they've come to Cape Town. The first time was in 2000, where everyone was hella very excited that you know they could come to South Africa. Um, we then had a situation where they came to South Africa because Ireland had a financial crash. And we, uh, we stood in for Ireland, and we now won the bid again for 2023. And Dylan's taking a, um, an excursion up there, so it's going to get some international exposure, which is, which is fantastic. Okay, and, I, and I need another plug just to acknowledge the water guys, geohydrologist John Weaver, another yeah. colleague of yours. He, he's sort of in the retirement stage, like many of us, but um, John Weaver had a fund. He... Very, very recently contributed 10,000 to the Overberg Geoscientist Group, which we're extremely grateful to. All of that money has been spent in uh, um, intervention, rock gardens, and Harold Porter Gardens with, with Sandy. Yeah. Fantastic. Only last one, back onto the fish. He wants to know if there's anything that can be done to, you know, to eliminate them, but to reintroduce the, the the older species, the original species. And I want to know any speculation on, on the color changes. What, what, how would the colors change between the fishes? Yo, one of the things I hate doing is talking outside of my, my area of expertise. <laughs> and we are now going way off. Um, I, I, I think there's nothing to do about the reintroduction um, don't quote me, but I think it's called the round-eyed herring. There's the one small fish and, and the other one. I, I, th- I think they've been nailed because they, they were estuarine species, so they could cope with a, a variation of salinity. 
and then they got trapped and slowly the, the water has freshened up. So I, I think that ship has sailed. Uh, but I, I think you really need to speak to, to someone far more knowledgeable about those things than, than I do. The, the color of the water, the way I understand it, it's the nutrients and algae that's in the water and um, the sunlight that goes into the water, it, it fracks off it to give it that green. So what happened with that brain flay is that uh, the water level was low, the carp in the way they feed were stirring up the bottom and then this water, uh, crin flay, uh, Krunflay's maximum depth, if I remember correctly, is, is five and a half meters, and that's in a very small area. The average depth of, of Krunflay is somewhere around about uh, two and a half, three meters. So it's a very shallow system. And the winds were turning up this, this water that had been disturbed at the bottom. Uh, it's now back to its, it's now uh, typical green color. What about Zoom people? With all the heavy rains that we've had here in the Western Cape, what it's done to the uh, subterranean water levels. I, for one, can testify that here in Honest Manor, apparently the water now runs the street. It hasn't done so for more than 20 years. So I think we're sort of almost having water at surface level. Yeah. So um, I've been monitoring the groundwater levels at Arabella Country Estate for 26 years. And uh, we've got we, we monitor the levels of the production boils, and we've got one monitoring hole that's specifically uh, to see how the wood level goes. And the way the hydrological cycle works is come the end of October, that's when the water levels are the highest, and then the summer kicks in and things start dropping. When we did our, um, our monitoring run in May, so that's June, July, August, September, it's four or five months ahead of when it should reach its peak. We were already higher this year than we were last year. So um, they, they respond. The interesting thing is that aquifers are generally not denuded. The water levels are generally where they naturally are. So all that's happening now is they now sort of overfull and the water is discharging wherever it can. Roger, last question, if there's no one else from me. Tanin recently sent me the rainfall figures for the Western Cape since 1970, and it's fascinating. Um, I, I came to UCT in 1977, and Marilyn moved with me to do a PhD, and we had one of those classic winter, Cape winters that rained in, I think, 76, 77, 78, and, and it was you know, worse than what we've just had now. And it's very interesting to see those cycles. And of course, you know, now people are jumping up and down saying, oh, you know, global warming, climate change. But if you look at those records, you know, it's a repeat of what a normal wet Cape winter should be. Correct. Comment. Are, are you trying to get me into trouble here? No, no. <laughs> All right, so, so what John's talking about, in my opinion, is climate variability. And we've always had climate variability. We, we talk about average rainfalls. But if we have an average rainfall, we have above average periods and we have below average periods. So I think uh, you saw that in the in the, um, the, the Hrunflay data. What I can tell you is that um, the start of winter was very wet. I'm, I measure the rainfall at my house. So uh, we've already had our average rainfall. Yesterday, I had to... Uh, Long story short, I've got a, a rainwater tank that feeds into the house. Yesterday, I had to fill up that tank manually. We haven't had rain for a month. So what are you guys talking about that we're having this wet winter? You know, it's, it's almost been a month where we've had no rainfall. There's no rain predicted for the, the next week. So these patterns are they all over the place. And I mean, it'd be fantastic to get somebody that that understands climate and understands rain and can, can explain it to us so that we can, we can put it in perspective. And there are some really, really good people around that know these things. But they also, I came across this term the other day, uh, which I found quite interesting. You get something called an expert blogger. <laughs> uh, let's not ask the expert bloggers, but it, I think it'd be really fascinating to have somebody who can explain these things properly to us so that we can understand it. Okay, Henny, you're done. 
Any, any last questions? Thanks, Roger. That was fantastic. We really do appreciate it. <laughs>